Welcome to the Simpletons podcast. I'm Laura and I'm here with Clark. And uh, this podcast episode, we're going to be discussing uh, a Catholic worker movement. Um, the Catholic worker, especially the Catholic worker houses in D.C. were a big influence on the starting of a simple house. And uh, so we want to discuss uh, the movement and the places in D.C. this week. Um, Clark, could you give us a little bit of an overview of the Catholic worker? Yeah, um... It's almost 100 years old now, founded by Dorothy Day and Peter Morin. And they were kind of the using the term social justice before anyone else. Like now it's a very popular secular term even, but they were kind of some of the originators, I would think. Um, it, it started up in New York City. It quickly ballooned out to 100 plus houses and farms. And these were just areas where people were directly serving the poor. Um, and I would say it had kind of like three marks or, or maybe four marks, but it seemed like it was always very personal. Like the Catholic workers took personal responsibility for the problems in society and for helping their neighbor. It was personal also in the sense that it was um, very much person to person. Often the people they served were on the kind of like boarded, became Catholic workers themselves. Um, there wasn't like, there was solidarity is what I'm trying to say. It also was political um, from the very beginning. Like it was very much a, we're working to change this world structurally, including through um, politics. Uh, and I think it also was, I'm kind of throwing this in. I don't know if a Catholic worker would normally say this. I feel like it was ecumenical from the beginning because when I start researching like different Catholic workers in the past, some of them kind of had crazy beliefs that you wouldn't call a uh, Catholic, you know? And even today, like here in Kansas City, I think about a decade ago now, but just um, maybe around 2010, a new Catholic worker house was founded and there were no Catholics. Right. It, it was like but a from its of, uh, I Dorothy Day and, and Peter Morin, who originated the Catholic worker, were both Catholic. Very much. Yeah. So it, it definitely had a strong Catholic identity, but I think it also had ecumenical identity. And just to yeah. clarify what happened here in Kansas City was... I think it was a bunch of Presbyterians wanted, I could have that wrong, by the way, I mm -hmm. apologize to the Catholic Works here if I do, but I think they wanted to do something and there was no model within their own uh, faith on how to do it, but they loved the Catholic worker model. So they just called it a Catholic worker and ran with it, you know? And, and the last thing is, I don't know if it's always been kind of anarchistic, um, but it definitely is that today, meaning like, there's almost no hierarchy in the Catholic worker. Like if you want to go to any town in America, form a house and start doing a project that you think is inspired by a Catholic worker, you're kind of a Catholic worker. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have a feeling that a lot of the Catholic workers have kept this, but I think that um, Dorothy Day thought like every house needed kind of like a mother and father <laughs> type of person, but there was like no you know, very formal structure. I was thinking about that too this morning, even I was, I was trying to get mm -hmm. my head around all the different Catholic workers. I knew it always seems like there is a father or mother figure that rises in the house. Yeah. Like naturally. Right. Naturally. Right. And it's not yeah. like a corporate, like you're the boss. No, no one is elected the father. <laughs> right. You just right. took on the responsibility of the, of being a father or mother. And that's how you got your authority, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. You got it the hard way. Yeah. So um, what, you had an interesting uh, experience with some seminarians. So we work with multiple seminaries at Semple House, but one of the ones we work with is up in uh, Northern Missouri's Conception Abbey Seminary. It's undergrad seminary. And uh, before this whole pandemic started, they would send their senior class down to kind of look at different ministries within the city mm -hmm. um, very widely. And they would always, oftentimes Simple House would host them or help direct that kind of tour of the ministries. And so we brought them to a Catholic worker house and um, the monk in charge said, how many of you have heard of Dorothy Day or the Catholic worker? And of the like dozen or so seminarians there, they were like, not one had ever heard of Dorothy Day or the Catholic worker. And then the monk like held his head and he was like, we have failed. You know, <laughs> right. I agree. <laughs> um, that's interesting uh, because I feel like Dorothy Day had a little bit of a resurgence um, when her cause was taken up 
uh, for canonization, right? I think she's a blessed now or a servant of God. I, I, yeah. yeah um, you'd think people would know even if they weren't into her type of work. You know, right, she, but, right. But surprisingly, I think she has faded, you know, in her yeah. fame, you know, within the church. Yeah. I I have an idea that maybe she's faded a little bit just because of uh, misconceptions about her, right? And um, and some of these maybe, misconceptions, like, I think we have, I've got a couple stories of just people who knew her and what mm -hmm. they told me about her. But, like, if you went to a Catholic worker house today, randomly in America, what would you expect to see? Um, so the, <laughs> one of the main things I associated with Catholic worker, um, uh, which I was like super into this in college was kind of the hippie vibe, you know, there was like a kind of hippie aesthetic, right? And, um, there were, uh, you typically you would find like all kinds of, um, different beliefs, like not just ecumenical, but even like within the Catholics that were there, um, uh, there was a broad range <laughs> of beliefs, um, a lot of rejection of like some of uh, the church teaching, um, even while considering themselves Catholic, right? Um, like, you know, even as basic as like Jesus lived, um, died and rose from the dead is like, was not a given <laughs> um, in, in, in the kind of Catholic worker circles that I was exposed to when I was in college and uh, maybe like at the beginning of a simple house, right? Um, now I, I think a lot of those people are um, probably pretty old, either elderly or have passed, right? And uh, there's just, um, I don't know, remnants of that, I think, in the existing Catholic workers. Not all I, of them, though. Like, I have I very like, good impressions of a few. I feel like you're being a little bit vague. but Okay, like, yeah. Like, meaning like, like you could go to a Catholic worker gathering and see a woman dressed up as a priest. Uh, right. Like, right. Yeah. And like so, I, I, I was invited to like a, an ordination of women, you know, at a Catholic worker house. Right. Right. So <laughs> I didn't go to that, but <laughs> yeah. And I think that, I think like we talked about this in a different setting that it seems like what it meant to be a liberal Catholic has been changing over the last 20 years, but like 20 yeah. years ago, being a liberal Catholic could mean that you literally rejected teachings of the church left and right mm -hmm. like you you may have yeah. a very loose association with the catechism at all it might just be yeah, an annoying right. book to you you know but you'd yeah. still be catholic you'd still be calling yourself a catholic you know right and yeah today that's rarer but i think if you went to a catholic worker house you'd never know what you would meet and that's why a yeah. lot of people maybe have been turned off by the catholic worker because maybe they were scandalized because but what i would emphasize is it's anarchistic you know, yeah. just because yeah. that house did that doesn't mean that the house a hundred miles away has anything to do with that, you know? Yeah. And I meet a lot of people who are very orthodox, very inspired by Dorothy Day, but I also meet people, you know, which it's like, I'm not even sure this is Catholic. <laughs> yeah, you know? right, right. Yeah. I do think like the, the two Catholic workers that I, um, or two Catholic workers that I hear people talking about that I think are thriving are like not so off the rails, right? Um, and that like the one at Notre Dame and the um, Zwix uh, Catholic worker, the Houston Catholic worker, right? I'm curious about the Zwicks. I'm, I met them um, maybe 15 years ago, went down to Houston mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. toured their Catholic worker and got shown around, um, got to meet their grandkids who were kind of getting involved, yeah. you know? And um, they were very interesting. Uh, I'm just kind of, I've been kind of curious. I'm kind of surprised they're still holding on. I'd like to go visit again and think, see what's going on. I think on. she passed. I oh, think. she did? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like right. a few years ago. Yeah. I, one, one of them did. And I'm so sorry. So Mark, Mark Zwick, I think is, was the husband. Yeah. And he right. was the mouthpiece. He said that his wife hated speaking in public and would, you know, <laughs> if he was dying of yeah. disease, she would put a bunch of aspirin in him just so she didn't have to go speak, you know? But he also said that his his kids weren't as interested in the Catholic worker, but his grandkids loved it. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. I remember I was sitting at a table with his grandkids who were like young, like they were like twelve or something. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, how do people know to come here? Because they were serving uh, people crossing the border. Yeah. You know? and I'm like, how do people who cross the border find you in Houston? And this kid goes, basically, we're famous. 
<laughs> and then his grandpa Mark was laughing about that. But that was kind of funny. yeah, but. yeah. They um, he and his wife wrote a great. Um, if anyone like wants to know more about the origins of the Catholic Worker, I, I they they have a book that's like it's just called the Catholic Worker Movement or something. Yes. But it talks about all the influences. And it, it's a great book. That seems to be really the great... authoritative book. Yeah, and it's really edifying and um, philosophical, and it, it's a great book. But we just said that um, there's like a lot of uh, Catholic. There's like an anarchistic side to the Catholic worker, right? And um, maybe uh, what the Catholic worker became didn't appeal to people as much, and the movement has become less prominent or Dorothy Day has become less prominent I don't know um, I don't know it's it's complicated with that I mean also yeah. what Dorothy Day does is very hard you know yeah and that's yeah, the right, reason why right. it might not be as popular too um, yeah I think Dorothy Day though like I've been collecting little like antidotes of Dorothy Day mm -hmm. that are like from because there's still a whole bunch of people who knew her yeah who around you know and yeah. I uh so whenever I would meet one I would kind of like try to piece it together because to me she's a mystery like i was right. never a huge fan of her writings not that they mm -hmm. were bad it was just like i'm like this is not what fills up my gas tank you know to do ministry or inspire me but i she's always been such an interesting figure mm -hmm. um as like a mysterious figure and one of the things my wife's family um is really cool and <laughs> my mother-in-law when she grew up dorothy day would visit her house and the reason was is my um my my mother-in-law's father so my wife's grandfather was a conscientious objector in world war ii and i think he had to spend the war in a labor camp kind of like a prison wow. type labor camp and dorothy day and and the catholic workers always been like pacifist more or less and they had him come speak at the catholic worker in new york city the main house and that's where he met his wife so oh, wow. uh, they were both involved with the Catholic worker, New Dorothy Day, and then they moved out um, and bought like a farm with no electricity out in Long Island and uh, started trying to farm. Like in the Hamptons, when the Hamptons wasn't the Hamptons. My wife's right? family <laughs> kind of hates it when I tell the story that way, that they bought a farm in the Hamptons, but that's basically what happened. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they started out there and that became kind of a retreat center for people like Dorothy Day that they would like when they wanted to get out of the city, you know, catch a train and go out in Long Island and go hang out with the Wheeland family. And it's been interesting to me because like my mother-in-law, my mother-in-law respects Dorothy Day. My mother-in-law is great. She also doesn't totally like Dorothy Day because some of the things Dorothy Day did annoyed her as a child. <laughs> anyway, one of the things was she wanted to go to Italy, you know, uh -huh. and she had this opportunity to, and Dorothy Day was like, you cannot let your daughter go to Italy. And my, oh so my, my mother-in-law was like, what? You know, she just thought my mother-in-law was too young. I think she was like 14 okay. or 15. was going to go stay with the family. And then oh, wow. uh, she did get to go though, and it was really great. And then the other thing Dorothy Day did <laughs> was my mother-in-law wanted to go to Catholic University down in D.C. or as a mm -hmm. proud alum of CUA. Yep. Uh, a whole yep. lot of proud alums at Simple House. Um, yep. And she wanted to go there and Dorothy Day told her parents, you cannot let your daughter go to CUA. This would have been like during, I think, the early 70s. And I think okay. CUA had um, some very notorious... Uh, priests at that time yeah you know who were kind of like uh notorious for their teaching yes and, and yeah. notorious being a code word for things we would not consider catholic right now you know what i mean some yeah. of the things they were saying right they were very radical priests and um but that also turned out to be a great decision for her too it was catholic university was a great place for her so um and then the other person um we're going to get to later, but she was a Catholic worker in DC named Connie. And, um, I, I'll just tell Connie's stories to Dorothy day, as opposed to tell you who Connie is right now. But Connie said that she went up to the main house in New York city and, um, needed like a drink of water in the middle of the night and went downstairs into the kitchen and, uh, turned on the light. And there was Dorothy day sitting in a corner smoking, saying the rosary. 
in the dark. <laughs> and uh, then Dorothy Day wanted to chat. And so Connie then stayed up, you know, an hour or so the rest of the night just chatting with Dorothy Day in the kitchen in the middle of the night, you know. Yeah. And the other thing Connie used to stress, and I don't know why she was stressing this because it wasn't like a, an issue with me. It was something that Connie yeah. wanted to just make a point that everyone knew for some reason. She would say, Dorothy Day was crazy conservative with the liturgy. And I don't think that's yeah. what we mean today, meaning like, she, I don't think she was into Latin mass or anything, but she was very yeah. conservative in the sense of like, um, she said that, Connie said that if a, I said, what do you mean? And Connie was like, well, if a priest showed up and wanted to do a mass, but didn't have the right vestments or didn't have the whole kit, she'd be like, no way, you know? And that she even would store vestments in the house. So wow. that if a priest did want to do a mass, uh, she could make sure it was done like with the proper, you know, solemnity, I guess, for a house mass. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that seems like uh, surprising compared to what I think the impression a lot of people have of Dorothy Day is, right? Right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, especially, I, I think, like, the Catholic workers have a very, many of them a very casual anything goes, you know. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Well, you, um, so the Catholic worker, because it is anarchistic, it's, it's kind of like the influence on Simple House wasn't necessarily Dorothy Day. The influence was the D.C. Catholic worker. Um, yeah. And Laura, what is your understanding of, like, what, how did that start in D.C., the Catholic worker that we got involved with? Sure. So there's um, <clears throat> a guy uh, named Michael Kerwin, um, and he uh, he grew up in D.C. He went to school at GW, and uh, so he, he started the houses. And um, it, it's unclear exactly. There's like a kind of some overlapping things in his life, right, that led to it, and it's not as like uh, linear maybe. But so he, he grew up uh, Dorothy Day would go to his house um, growing up. His parents actually met at the New York Catholic Worker. Really? Um, oh, yeah. just like my mother-in-law's parents. That's right, great. yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and actually I, I read this the other day. I had forgotten about this. His, so his, his mom was German. I met, I never met Michael Kerwin. I don't think you ever met Michael Kerwin, but we knew his family. I uh, interviewed his mom once for a school project and uh, she was German. Her family was Jewish or they were of Jewish descent and they had to like escape the Nazis and they moved <laughs> to Iran before moving to the States. <laughs> and, um, and then she and her husband met at a Catholic worker and, uh, they, uh, lived in DC. Um, and so Michael grew up like having, uh, you know, would he knew Dorothy day growing up and, uh, he says he graduated uh, from college and was kind of like bumming around the house one summer. And uh, his mom was like, you have to go do something. Why don't you go help Dorothy up in New York? So he spent like uh, some time living at the New York Catholic Worker. Um, and then uh, from what I understand, came back um, to go to grad school at GW. And uh, he had this uh, thing happen where um, a, uh, so this is the part where I kind of don't understand exactly the timeline, like he had been at the Catholic worker already, but then he had this thing happen where this homeless guy asks him for money and um, he says no. And he's walking back to his apartment and he's kind of like thinking like he just wants to buy booze anyway, like he doesn't really want food. He had asked for money for food and he's like, yeah, right. He doesn't want food. Um, but he goes uh, back to his apartment and he says that, like, out of spite, he decides to make some soup for this guy and bring it back. <laughs> so he makes some soup and uh, leaves it uh, down by uh, where the guys would all sleep, like, on uh, the, like, grates in the city where, like, heat would come up. And uh, so he left the soup on the grates and then he, like, keeps doing this and he added tea and some other, you know, sandwiches or whatever. And uh one night he leaves a soup he it was like a gallon jar of soup and this homeless man he would just leave it and go this homeless man comes and he cracks the jar over michael's head no, did he yeah. crack it or pour it out michael said crack 
Okay, the but, dark. I well, don't know how good. that wouldn't that's kill good. someone. I, I was I was just making sure that wasn't the legend of Michael Kerwin starting to grow, but that's that good. That was <laughs> the legend of Michael Kerwin according to Michael Kerwin. I okay, good. He good. said, "This man cracks the soup over his head, the jar, and it's like boiling hot soup is like you know." all over his body, but he can't feel it because he's like so terrified, you know? Um, and instead of like running or yelling at him, he just said to the man, like, why did you do that? And uh, the man was like, you treat us like dogs. You treat us like pets. You just leave our little like food bowls here and you run off, you know? Um, why don't you like talk to us? And so that, that was kind of a, like a turning point for him. And so he started, you know, he was like bringing soup every night. He would hang out, uh, with the guys down there. And, um, this guy started, uh, bugging him about, uh, could he come, you know, uh, take a shower, um, in his like, like dorm apartment, um, because he had a job interview and Michael was like, Oh no, you know, the university doesn't allow that. Um, but like every, he said he knew, like everyone kind of knew that it was like, whatever, the university doesn't allow it, but like Michael is not letting you do that. So it's like, you can have this relationship that's sort of limited to being here at the greats. And uh, the guy kind of keeps pestering him and um, Michael relents, lets him uh, come back to his apartment and um, the guy showers, shaves and everything. And Michael had been like, you, you can only like shower and shave. I have a class to go to. You have to leave, you know, today after you're done. He comes back and, um, the guy is like uh totally cleaned up you know looks totally different and he's like asleep on an armchair and he doesn't have the heart to tell him you know to go and uh then there is like a thing that like the next day he made the man made breakfast for him so he didn't let him he he let him stay longer he comes back at night and the man is like uh like listening to uh like Wagner or he's like listening to classical music and this is just like blowing his mind um of like you know kind of destroying the perception he had of like what these homeless guys were you know and uh um so the guy ends up staying for a really long time like 30 days or something and um these other homeless people start like pestering him um you know and eventually he's got like 15 guys sleeping in this apartment on the floor and uh this um so this is gw student housing this is a, he's running GW a homeless student shelter housing, in, in gw student housing yes okay and he gets this phone call from a nun who said i hear you're taking people in and i have this like man who's about to get kicked out of his housing because he's like dying of cancer and he doesn't have a place to go can you take him <laughs> so he objects to this at first but eventually takes the guy and um you know they're basically doing hospice care and like he and all the homeless guys are like super freaked out because they've never like just <laughs> I, this man wait, is can i pause dumb. this yeah like, it's like i work with a lot of like college age students you know what i mean or yeah. recent college grads right and yeah. a lot of them want to be radical <laughs> yeah and that's a good impulse i think right but like yeah i don't even know if you can like is michael Kerwin even a model with this you know what i mean it's almost like it's like yeah, this well, is so crazy. Like like this it's is totally crazy, hardcore but, and radical, but it's also like right. I'm not sure I should ever suggest anyone do this, you know? No, and I think about some of the stuff that Dorothy Day did and the way she ran her houses and the stuff that Michael did and it's just like a legal nightmare, you know, yeah. and a liability nightmare. And I don't know how you you know, I don't know what you do about that. Um and they had like a specific call, right? Um, he had like a specific call. Um, I hate the word liability because, you know, running a nonprofit he, ministry, yeah. the word yeah. liability has killed many a great idea, you know? Yeah. But it's yeah. also not just a, it's also dangerous. Like we know multiple people who've right. died while serving the homeless. I mean, I guess I don't know them personally, but um, one of the DC Catholic workers, Art Laffin, I believe his brother was murdered. Uh, oh, wow. while working a soup line. And then the guy who founded the huge, it was a priest who founded the hu the largest homeless shelter in Washington, D.C. Um, it has an acronym name. I can't remember it anymore. It's been a while since I thought of that place. Um, it was right where 395 comes out of the tunnel. Some? Some. No, not some. So others some. might eat? No? Not some, unless they took it over. It was like a four-letter acronym, I thought. 
Um, but he was okay. murdered. He was followed home from the soup line by a schizophrenic wow. guy. And you know, and I've worked with schizophrenic homeless, and it's a, it's yeah. a you know, it's a uh, issue. You know, yeah, safety. Yeah. You know, right? So anyway. Yeah. Michael yeah. Kerwin was not murdered by the homeless. He was not murdered. He pulled this off. He was off. not murdered. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what? What? So he took in a guy with cancer. Keep, keep going with that. So the, the the man dies in his apartment, you know, and uh, he he doesn't know what to do. So it was like he knew this man was dying, hadn't planned for when the man actually dies. The man dies. He's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? He calls his mom, and his mom was like, you have to call nine one one. That's like the only thing you can do, <laughs> you know. So he does, and he's like, oh. Uh, kind of knows he's in for it, you know? Um, and um, the university is like, you have to get all these people out. Like, you cannot do this, you know? And he's like, okay. And then doesn't do anything, and the university never follows up. Um, so then on another occasion, uh, the this guy comes and asks if he can shower at his place. And it was a young man... Um, and uh, he doesn't come out for a long time. Michael goes to check on him, and he had OD'd in the bathtub. Um, and um, uh, just one interesting thing was that he was like a homeless guy, but he was like from a well-to-do family, and he had this kind of fancy funeral in Georgetown. Um, it's interesting. Um, um, okay, so then the university, um, like... Uh, there's a lawsuit because they're like, you have to leave, you know? Um, and Michael's like, I can leave. I can find a place to live, but what about all these people? <laughs> and they're like, no, you have to leave. So it goes to court and the court, uh, the judge is like sympathetic to Michael um, and he likes what he's doing. So he's like, okay, you have three months to find a place. Um, and uh, so he stays, you know, in the university housing until he finds a place. And um, he bought, he buys like a, like a, a shell in LaDroit Park, um, which is like close to the Shaw neighborhood um, if, for people that know DC. Um, and uh, there's like no heat, you know, windows are boarded up and everything. And uh, he, um, he moves, you know, he moves the whole cohort there. They're all sleeping on the floor together. And uh, so that was like the, the first house he started and they had people um living there for a while uh but eventually the house just it, it was like too expensive to keep up and so then they they bought these other two houses on t street um in the you know close close to that neighborhood um so um and they eventually one, bought a farm out in west virginia also yeah that's right that's right um so one became a um like a home for women, right? And then the other uh, was like a soup line and a home for men. Um, and the farm was like an attempt at a like retreat dry out place for homeless alcoholics, you know, like let's get yeah. them out into the country. The, you know, and Catholic worker farms have always existed. That's always been a thing. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that seems to me like different about this is, I'm kind of taking this from his sister, Maria, who told mm -hmm. me that like Michael almost didn't let anyone ever help him. Yeah. You know, um, like there were some notable people who helped him some, like we knew uh, Sally did, Sister Sally. Yeah. Uh, there was Connie, who was a homeless woman he took in, who ended up helping him a lot. Um, the Copley Crip community in Georgetown would raise some money for him. St. Saint, Saint Stephen's in, um, by DW. Right. Great. Yep. They, they were huge. Yeah. Supporters mm -hmm. of his. Right. Yeah. And, um, there was a guy named Dr. Mike Riley, who I think was also big with bread for the city there in mm -hmm. DC was a big supporter yeah. too. But like, it's just amazing. This idea that this guy was running. I think you have to imagine the chaos level, like, uh, He's running three different houses, including a farm he can, that's like at least three hours away. So he can't be at all these places at once, right? And so it's basically yeah. the homeless running the places. Yeah. And I mean, he's right. like sleeping on the floor with the homeless, you know? Right. Yeah. I also heard stories like there would be refugee families who needed to go somewhere and they like a whole family with kids would be underneath his kitchen table and they'd put a blanket yeah. over it so they had some privacy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and, and because it was chaotic, chaotic things happened. Uh, there's a story that at the Catholic Worker Farm, um, they had some animals as pets, and 
two of the guys took the pig to town, sold it for alcohol money, and on the way yeah. home, one murdered the other. You know. Yeah. And um, yeah. Connie told me, and I, Gerald, uh, Michael's brother, told you know there's a, a graveyard over at the farm that he would bury homeless people, and I think the guy who was murdered is buried out there too. And yeah. um, Connie said that like if a homeless man Michael knew died in the city, Michael would drive the body out and bury it in his mm -hmm. cemetery out in West Virginia. And Connie said she had to go along for those rides. And at the time, I'm, I was pretty, you know, I was used to cell phones. I was like, why'd you have to ride with him? With the, and she's like, you don't want to get pulled over with a dead body in the car without at least one other person there. <laughs> so. Yeah. We also should mention honorably that, honorable mention Catholic worker in DC, Michael Kerwin was not the only one there's something called the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker House where Art Lathen and Colin mm -hmm. McCarthy are um, long time people there. And I remember them from being at the Catholic Worker that they would help us out and bring us food yeah. and things. And yeah. then um, Michael was inspired by an, uh, an African-American guy, Catholic Worker, who I think was probably the very first DC Catholic Worker. And he yeah. was feeding people like in the 40s. Like Michael had these pictures of these like Ma I don't know what a, I don't it wasn't a Model T. It was like whatever the Model T version of a truck was, like a real old timey mm -hmm. car running a soup line out of it. You know, yeah, in yeah, black and yeah. white photos. It was pretty cool. Yeah, and so the I, the men's house and the soup line was named after him. Yes, Llewellyn Scott, mm -hmm. I believe was his name. That's a great name, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so one interesting detail. Um, I so I never met Connie. Um, you knew Connie, but uh, I understand that Connie was uh, homeless and had moved into the house with them at LaDroit Park. And when he wanted to open the women's house, like Connie arose as like the natural leader um, for that and, house. And, right? and so she became a worker. <laughs> and that is more than I knew at the time. Uh, when I knew mm -hmm. Connie, I had like uh, Michael's sister said, you know, I think she might have been a homeless woman. <laughs> <laughs> but now she's like running the homeless shelter, you know? Yeah. And Connie was kind of amazing. Like Connie did, I don't know that anyone knows the story of Connie right now. I'll tell you what I know. It's still kind of a mystery. She was helping Islamic refugees throughout the nineties. Mm -hmm. um, and she, her whole, she was kind of very famous within that community. Her whole house was filled with gifts that they'd given her, like, you know, yeah. um, Oriental rug. What do you call those rugs that are from the Middle East? I guess they're called Oriental rugs. I don't know. No, they're not. They have a different... Uh, well, she had these well, rugs. Anyway, and yeah, she had these, like, light fixtures, these, like, amazing light fixtures. So I never right. met Connie, but I, I lived in the house, right? And there's, like, a lot of, like, um, like Coptic... There was like a really neat Coptic cross in the house. Right. Um, and when I was helping Connie yeah. out a little bit, um, my main job was at the men's house, but then I would go down and help Connie uh, man her house a little bit. And yeah. if I like went into like, and I, um, there was a, there was a restaurant run by this Egyptian guy. And just mm -hmm. cause I knew Connie, just cause I said I knew Connie, my food was free. I felt guilty yeah. going there. I would go there like once every couple months because I felt guilty. I wanted to eat there all the time, but I didn't right. want him to be giving. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want, want this immigrant advantage. guy giving me yeah. free meals all the time. But um, it right. was delicious food, you know. And when Connie passed um, at the funeral, they um, there was so much of the, like the Islamic community at her funeral. Yeah. That um, after they did all the Catholic funeral and burial and graveside stuff um, and people were leaving Islamic men gathered over her grave and did this kind of traditional Islamic wow. prayer and I have this like wow. image in my head of all these men with their kind of hands out in a line praying over Connie's grave like wow. by some Islamic tradition and it was just it was just kind of cool you know um, yeah yeah that's really neat I think we should talk about how we got to the Catholic Worker, like how we got involved with this situation. Yeah, okay. Well, so you you, you got there first. <laughs> right. I um, had a good relationship with a monastery out here, Conception Abbey again, in Missouri. Mm -hmm. And um, the current abbot, uh, Abbot Benedict, he was just Father Benedict at the time, um, was a good friend of Michael's. Um, abbot Benedict was a um, seminarian, I think, I think it was a seminary. He might have been there for studies after he was ordained. 
at Catholic U. Mm-hmm. And he befriend, he became good friends with Michael. And Michael would drive out to Missouri to see him and talk to the seminary. And I've also met seminarians who saw Michael Kerwin give these talks. And they said they were unbelievably inspiring. Mm-hmm. And when I went to that monastery and um, my spiritual director knew I was out in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, what should I do? He's like, ooh, you should go see Father Benedict's friend, Michael Kerwin. Mm. And then my spiritual director said, hold it. He may have passed, you know. (laughs) But so I went out there and uh, found the Catholic worker. Michael Kerwin had passed. It was being run by his sister, Maria. Um, Yeah, he passed in 1999, by the way. Oh, wow. So I I missed him by like two years, I guess. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Maria, her husband, John, Gerald, uh, Michael's brother, and Lawrence, Michael's brother, we're all pretty involved with kind of keeping these three places open. And what's interesting about it is I think the three places were more organized after Michael depart after Michael died yeah. than during his lifetime. Like Maria yeah, ran right. a tight ship and Gerald tight was ship. running yeah. that farm and it yeah. actually was sober out there, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. like my, another her- story I heard from the monks. Well, the story everyone told me was that Michael was very strange with money that like if someone gave him a $10,000 donation, he may not have it by the time he went to bed. Like it was given yeah. away. Right, right, right. yeah. Uh, one of the monks told me kind of as a joke, he said, if there was an icon of, of Michael Kerwin, it would be Michael Kerwin on the third story of his Catholic worker house, throwing cash out the window. <laughs> Just blessing people with the money all the time, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So it wasn't a big discernment factor for him what he did with the money. I remember one time I was cleaning out the Catholic worker because we uh-huh. inherited one of the Catholic Worker Houses for Simple House. And I found this letter Michael Kerwin had written. Mm-hmm. And it was this letter where he'd loaned somebody in West Virginia $35,000 <laughs> on nothing. No contract, yeah. no loan document. Uh-huh. And the letter was just like, I kind of need that money back. <laughs> like, could you could you repay me something, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, apparently he never got that money. But it made me feel better about the way we run money at Simple House. I was like, oh, yeah, I yeah. was feeling better I about said- some mistakes of money mistakes. I was like, oh, well, I didn't do this. <laughs> yeah. He, um, you know, uh, apparently um, when Cardinal Hickey came to D.C., he went and visited the house on 1305. And he was like what you're doing is great. I'm going to get Catholic charities to write you a check. And Michael said, no, but we need is more workers. <laughs> it's like, we don't but, need money. Um, yeah, well, the, but they did need money. So that was the crazy thing. Um, well, they kind of needed money because I don't know if they needed money. I say that because when I was at the Catholic worker years after Michael had passed, Maria's rule was we're going to shut this place down when the money stops. Yeah. But money yeah. kept coming in and she did zero fundraising, but it was just like, <laughs> We'd get like checks from like a general in the army said, I met Michael, changed my life. Here's 200 wow. bucks. And Maria would have to write back, Michael passed away, blah, 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 mm-hmm. you know. But yeah. money kept coming in the door. And she said, as long as this money comes in the door, we'll keep this place open. He, uh, just as far as like his money discernment, um, he decided he wants to buy this farm. And uh, he hears there's this couple in Virginia selling this farm uh, for $48,000. He goes and visits the farm, falls in love with it. Tell him, he told them he was going to buy the farm. Um, he didn't have money to buy the farm. So St. Stephen's does a fundraiser, you know, for the farm and they raise $3,000. <laughs> so he's like, well, that's not enough. But then the next day somebody comes, shows up at the parish office and says, I'll write the check for the difference. You know, it was just wow. like, yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. I, got, I kind of left speechless, but <laughs> I don't know where to go from there. <laughs> It's also such like, like, I think it's all very holy, but it was also very harebrained. You know what I mean? That you're just going to have yeah. a farm you couldn't live at and send yeah. a bunch of guys out there to take care of themselves. Yeah. And yet it seems to have been beautiful as, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what is interesting just as far as him being a model, it's like he had a specific call and I think both you and I have met people that have tried to like imitate the harebrained thing and it's bad. Right. And it's very bad, you know. Um, That's right. So let's talk about, like, what the actual ministry was when we got there, because that's what most influenced us. Right. Um, 
I had been working as a consultant downtown and I started serving uh, at the house a couple mornings because they'd start quite early and then I'd go into work. And um, But eventually I, I left my job and moved into the house as a live-in. Um, mm-hmm. And the house had like a couple functions. Like it was a, I think we also have to talk about what DC was and what it was becoming. Yeah. DC yeah. in the eighties was rough, like really yeah. rough all through DuPont circle. Um, a lot of homeless, a lot of very abandoned, poor houses, things like this, right? All kind of, I think as a result of riots and things that had happened after Martin Luther King's death. And, and then there was this transition happening uh, while we were there and it was mm-hmm. such a, it was such a dramatic transition that you could literally like watch almost, it, it was as if like in real time you could watch it. Like certainly if you took a photo of street blocks every year for five years, you would see a dramatic change over five years. Yeah. And I mean, I remember when I moved into like, uh, the 939 T street, it was like, okay, you can walk on this street but not on this street. You can walk on this street. Like you knew exactly which streets, which blocks you could walk on. Right. Yeah. No, DC was marching from DuPont circle East, meaning like you were seeing renovations and property values skyrocket towards the East, you know, and now it's even marching beyond the river. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's marched. Yeah. (laughs) It's marched. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm dated in my knowledge. Um, Mm -hmm. so, when he bought these houses, they were uh, kind of like really rundown houses. I thought I saw something like one of the T-shirt houses was bought for 15000 So I don't know. Yeah. It's possible, you know. Um, and so when what we were doing in the house was we were serving about 100 to 300 homeless people uh, three mornings. It, I think the house was mm-hmm. open from about 6 a.m. to noon. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and the house was the front room where you could exchange clothes because Maria didn't want to run out of clothes. So you literally had to give her your underwear and she would give you a new pair of underwear. And then she'd wash her underwear, which was like amazing doing this like homeless underwear wash with unbelievable amounts of bleach, right? You could sign up to do your laundry while you were there. So only four or five people that morning would be able to do that because it took so long. You could sign up to get a shower, about a dozen people would get a shower in the house shower, and then we'd feed 100 to 300 people at a soup line. I, and then we had about seven guys living in the house who were who were homeless, now at a home, and were trying to um, kind of transition. The hope was that they were uh, had a chance of transitioning and you know moving mm-hmm. out of the house. Yeah. So at what point did you get roped into it, Laura? So you had moved in, I think. No, maybe not. You hadn't moved in yet. I think, um, so you had been visiting there and, uh, and I, I don't know, you pulled, you pulled me in and, um, you know, I don't have like a great memory, but I, I think I would just help, you know, uh, get food on the table. And I remember sitting at the table and eating, you know, uh, with some of the guys, um, and, uh, helping to organize the clothes a little bit. Um, so yeah. And it was um, overwhelmingly I, I, men. Like it was at least probably nine yeah, men Yeah, there, there were some woman. women. I remember one yeah. specific woman, um, that would come. Um, I remember talking to her a few times. Um, there was like, you know, that, so I was in college at that point and I, I was like into like the Pax Christi movement and, uh, sort of more social justice and i i just remember that there was like always like the buzz like oh did you meet so and so did you see so and so down in fort benning you know and it was like this very hippie vibe and so i was like you invited me and i was like super excited to go and then maria's like that 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 you know yeah like, so maria is not a hippie. hippie yeah right. this was yeah. not a hippie catholic worker house <laughs> at any stretch right this is a very yeah. orthodox by the book orderly yeah um but it was very personal too though like <clears throat> it kind of had yeah. the good part of being a hippie of like the sharing the you know at the and i think that was the big influence on simple house i'd say yeah yeah right you i mean you were this was like a really small house it was a narrow house so you were like really in there like with people right and you were sitting with them you were rubbing shoulders with them um you know 
you were going to sit down, you sat down at the chairs they sat. Yeah, they were showering yeah. in your shower. Right. You know, yeah, it was very personal. Yeah. And I thought that was amazing, just how simple yeah. it was and how personal it was. And it really, to, in my mind, it opened doors in my mind about what was possible. Right. Yeah. I thought, um, so uh, the women's house, um, I, th I thought an interesting aspect of it was like, um, so I don't know, the women's house was at some point supposed to be transitional or something. I don't know. But it was like the women that were living there had been there for a while, you know. And, and when I moved in with Lucy, Lucy had been living there for like 17 years. Um, and uh, but, but it was like... To clarify sure, that ahead. for people who aren't familiar with the homeless and things, these women were mentally disabled. It wasn't like they moved in and, you know, were being lazy and not transitioning out, you know. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and they were um, elderly um, as well. Um, but I, I thought an interesting aspect of it was like, th this was their home, you know? It wasn't like, you live at this facility that I run, you know, or something. It was like, this was their home. They had their room. They had their stuff. They, you know, you shared a kitchen with them. Um, you should not move their stuff that you didn't like out of the kitchen because that's rude, you know? <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and that, that was like a really, for me, that was a different thing, right? Um, I feel like what you're saying is it wasn't a facility. It was a Yeah, home. it wasn't a facility and there was like a respect to their sort of like... Um, I but, remember but thinking it, at yeah. the time that the word non-institutional was like really important. Yeah, yeah. Mhm. Mm and I don't know uh when you so you lived at the um you lived at the men's house um and um did you have more responsibilities than the homeless guys that had moved in there or I mean it well, was like you guys were roommates, right? I had my own room. Uh I think a lot of No, yeah, or housemates, I right, guess. Right, we were housemates, yeah. Yeah. Um I think like my responsibility was working the three days, you know, mm -hmm. every week and, you know, mopping up and doing things like that. And then as Simple House started to launch, as it became clear that I needed to do something different and mm -hmm. move on, I, I kept living there like probably seven, eight months after I started working yeah. on the Simple House project because um, we needed to get a location and everything. And I'd still work the open house days. And then on the off days, I'd work on Simple House, you know, try to get that up and running. Yeah. But yeah, but, the, but the the homeless guys that lived there also had responsibilities at the house. I can't remember what no? the responsibilities okay. were, you know. Okay. I think they were pretty much able, just given a room and able to kind of like run their life as they saw fit. Okay. They didn't have to show up yeah. an open house or anything. Yeah, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, I remember the house, like, uh, we were not, that Catholic worker wasn't very political, you know. Right. Um, and I feel like Simple House also has not had the desire for almost all of its history to be political. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like lately, you know, we're filming this in the winter of 2021, you know, the Black Lives Matter um, protests were this summer with the rioting and all the resulting stuff. Um, I feel like in a way... I, we've needed to be a little bit more political now because there's certain political ideas that like kind of attack the core of our ministry. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Like ideas that like, you know, missionary work is kind of like spiritual imperialism or, yeah. you know, like what is the right way to help people? You know, that I think we have to stand up for what we believe in that, but mm -hmm. we've never been as political as the normal Catholic worker. Like we're not going to yeah. protests. We're not doing things like that. Right. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about how this whole crazy thing came to an end. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. So I, I guess the thirty the thir the men's house closed first, right? And so, like you said, the neighborhood was getting nicer. Um, neighbors were spending a lot more money to buy their houses there, and uh, they had ideas about what their neighborhood should be like, right? <laughs> yeah. As um, as your neighbors start buying half million dollar townhouses that are connected to an illegal soup kitchen, things get hairy. Yeah. And one of the things that <laughs> happened was like the two neighboring townhouses had 
wooden privacy fences in their front yard, which you never see in DC. That's not a thing to put a wooden yeah. privacy fence in the front yard of a townhouse. But the privacy fences only faced the Catholic worker so that all the guys on the porch who slept there at night or who were waiting to come in at 6 a.m., they just didn't have to, like, they had a little bit of division between our house and all these other nice right. houses. Right, right, right. Um, but there, I mean, there was a real, even when the neighborhood was changing, I mean, there was a real need for that in that neighborhood, you know? It wasn't... I would say there's yeah. always a real need for it. There's always been a lot of homeless in the rich part of town in D.C. That's yeah. an issue. But Yeah. And there's been less homeless in the poor part of town. But mm -hmm. the other issue is there is a huge need for personal ministry. Yeah. You know, you can show me that there's a, there, there is factually just enough soup lines in DC at this point. Like food yeah. is not the issue. Right. Right. But right. like, um, there is not enough people loving, knowing their first names. Yeah. You know, I remember one yeah. time, like we had like a lot of rules in the house. Like you couldn't like come in drinking alcohol or something. And, um, there were guys who were really good friends of the house that were also kind of wild. Like they wouldn't show up one day cause they were in jail. Right. <laughs> and there were like things like, you know, a guy drew a knife on another guy in the house and the cops came in and disarmed them, never filed a report, gave the knife to Maria left, didn't file a report cause they knew that could help shut us down. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember doing laundry once where this guy had forgot to take his crack rocks out of his pocket. And we like discovered it while doing the laundry. Like it had this little container and these little rocks inside and yeah. we like destroyed it. And the guy went nuts that yeah. we destroyed his crack, you know, and he started crying. It was really sad. Uh. But then, but this other memory I had was, uh, there was this guy who just kind of talking about the need of it. I'm sorry, I'm so off track with this, but there was this guy who was kind of Maria's favorite in a way. Like he just was like a grown up kid and he was yeah. super mischievous. I can't yeah. remember his name right now. But I remember I went, but he was always pulling stuff over, trying to get one over. <laughs> but always kind of, there was something nice about it because it was just childlike. <laughs> but then, yeah. like, I remember going to the park, um, one of the circle parks in D.C., and um, I'm sitting there hanging out with some guys from the Catholic Worker, who you know, homeless guys, and, and he walks up, and he's got a uh, one of those tall beers, right? And it's in a brown sack. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, you know, was kind of joking, but I kind of put on a really stern face and I said, you put that beer down right now. You're not allowed <laughs> to have that. Right. And he just like froze and could not decide if my authority <laughs> extended all the way to the park. And then I go, I go, I bet that's an Arizona iced tea, isn't it? Yeah. And, she, <laughs> and he goes, yeah. That's what it is. And I'm like, okay, then. <laughs> um, That's good. Okay. Well, well, all right. So how did these things end? So we, it, all the neighborhoods gentrifying around the Catholic Yeah, the neighbors kind of were taking issue greater and greater extent. And so I, what I had understood was that um, some neighbors kind of, uh, came in under false friendly pretenses, right? Saying they were interested in the work and they wanted to support it or whatever, but they were uh, taking mental notes while they were in there and um, reported um, the soup line, right? It, they, they were like missing, they needed three sinks and they had two sinks or something. There, there was like a kind of a technical thing right. like that so not only was it like an unregistered kind of rush it just had a whole bunch of code problems and there yeah. was like this like in just to paint a picture it was a very normal townhouse in every way except it had an industrial kitchen like we had yeah. a walk-in freezer you know like a right like a restaurant right right so but it had a dining room living room right. rooms upstairs right so no one in the dc city council probably ever wrote a law thinking we don't want people feeding the homeless out of townhouses but like given all the different codes restaurants are supposed to follow and all the different codes, yeah. we were illegal probably 10 different ways. You know? Yeah, yep, yep. And I think, yeah. you know, in the history of Simple House, you kind of see that um, if you're doing something in a nice neighborhood, uh, your neighborhoods are very nice to you. Your neighbors are very nice to you and they go, oh, you guys are such good people. Good job serving the homeless. Yeah. While they're shutting you down legally. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if you do something in a poor neighborhood, they'll be very rude to you to your face. They'll be like, we don't need that problem here. And I've been yelled at before. <clears throat> and, but then they won't legally shut you down. Right. You right. know? Um, yeah. And we try to, I just want to, I don't want to I take it seriously when our neighbors yell at us and we try to do everything we can not to be good neighbors. So that's yeah. kind of been a, a focal point of Simple House. It's not like we're just like, well, the poor have to put up with all this, you know, yeah. the rich don't because they have lawyers, you know, but yeah. Um, yeah, we try to, we try to be good neighbors, but mm -hmm. yeah. So that house got yeah. shut down by the law and ended up being given to the diocese. Is that right? Yeah, I think it, right. I think it went to Catholic Charities. With, and with then some I don't idea remember. that it had to still be used to help the homeless. Yeah, I'm not sure what constraints they put on it, but yeah, I think so. It had to go to a nonprofit, right? Just because of nonprofit mm -hmm. rules, right? They couldn't mm -hmm. just like, um, yeah. So and they did. They had something there, and I, I don't know. I doubt it's still there, but I don't actually know. I thought it I closed a couple years after they gave it. I kind of yeah, thought that I, was I think too that, bad. That rings a bell. Yeah, yeah I kind of thought that was kind of. I think the diocese felt a need to take it not not out of greed but just out of yeah you're you're being you know it was a very in, it was a very important little institution catholic institution yeah. and somebody needed to yeah. take it over you know yeah and so then the other catholic worker house is given to us at simple mm -hmm. house and you're the first simple house resident of that place right yeah yeah we called that the t street house yeah and they had they had been trying to um the women that were living there uh were they had been trying to find a uh place for them to go and one of the ladies ada was moved to a catholic work uh, sorry a catholic charities house in southeast that was able to um but uh lucy because she would refuse to get any like uh allow any doctor to like give her a checkup or anything like they just couldn't <laughs> move her out of the house um so the house so, came with residents it was given to us yeah. but we were told you know so we had our missionaries including you yeah. like living with you know women who'd lived there during the catholic worker days yeah yeah they still had their same bedrooms and you know well so it was just it was lucy and then it was um sally who um had not been a homeless woman she was a a nun and she had kind of like all these projects around the city and she was a little bit older and so she had her uh room there as a place for a rest and uh yeah yeah so and she kind of yeah. kept that until we needed the room but we were going to yeah. keep lucy there as long as it made sense you know it was an interesting yeah. way to take people who just graduated college move them in with you know lucy and you know yeah it's an interesting situation. and and lawrence so lawrence was still living there when i moved in we kind of had an overlap uh, oh yes michael so lawrence yeah. was caretaking it for the catholic worker he's michael Curlin's yeah. brother and lawrence yeah. deserves a huge thank you for simple house it's hard yeah. to us imagine us surviving our first year he basically yeah. taught me how to do home renovations on the house we bought and yeah. then he also was the caretaker of the t street house that eventually went to us and mm -hmm. uh, that was huge too yeah yeah. So, but then, um, but then the, then the last property was the farm out in West Virginia. And I think they attempted a couple times to keep that somehow a Catholic worker farm and it mm -hmm. didn't quite pan out correctly. Right. Gerald was the one in charge of that, I think. And it be, ended up becoming Bethlehem farms, which right. is, um, as far as I know, there's only three locations, but Nazareth farms is the original out in West Virginia. They do home repair ministry. Then there's Bethlehem farms, kind of a spinoff of that and then here in kansas city there's jerusalem farms right so yeah i think that kind of covers it laura what else yeah do you have i to think say? so too i i'm trying to think um i think that's good yeah yeah i think all so right. too all if right you, well we thank get, you Clark. if we get more thoughts we'll we'll share them in future episodes okay great all right thank um, you for listening to okay. the simple house podcast please subscribe and uh look forward to future episodes Talk See to you, you soon, later, Clark. <laughs>